that, ladies? Well, Brother Will Hill and his family have been, uh, actually, we have supported you, I think, from the beginning, from the time you went to the field. Is that correct? Yeah, 2018, and uh, to Japan. And we've had a lot of folks join uh, since then that haven't met them. I will say this, right after the service, they have to hit the road because they have to be at a funeral in Doraville at 3 o'clock today. And then got to be in another town for a service tonight at 6 o'clock. So he's moving. So I'm sure they'll be glad to shake your hand afterwards and all, but they can't hang around too late. They've got to, got to hit the road. I, I appreciate them being able to get in. We, we worked to try and get this work this date out and had to move it around a couple of times, and, and uh, I'm glad we're able to do that. For those that weren't here when they, they first came, I'll just give you a little background on how they came. I love Japan. I always have. It's always had a special place in my heart. And uh, when I became a, uh, became a pastor, I said, I want to have a missionary to Japan. And uh, we, we tried one, and it didn't work out, and another one, that didn't work out. And, and uh, then by process, the Lord led me to find out about Brother Hill. And, uh, boy, we met with him, and they were just exactly what, you know, the Lord was laying on my heart. And, and uh, so they, we've been supporting them since then, and they have done an outstanding job. Uh, if you're if you're on Facebook at all, he does a lot of videos, a lot of pictures, and things like that. You can see uh, they've been very busy doing a great job. And you're about at the end of your furlough, right? You're about to head back before long, so I'm sure he'll tell you all that. And uh, he's got a, some slide presentation to let you know. But they're doing a great job, and they are in Niigata, which is where the earthquake was, right? Yeah, right next to it. So you heard recently about the big earthquake in Japan. Now all of your folks were okay, right? So we thank the Lord for that. But that's where they are. So brother, you come on up and. Tell us what's going on. Preach for us. Pastor Henry, thank you so much. God bless you. I appreciate you. Well, uh, it's good to be back with you this morning. Uh, we, let's see, we, uh, we've actually been in Japan since 2015, uh, and uh, we, we came by here 2018, if, I, if I'm remembering right. And that, uh, we've been in Japan for about eight years serving the Lord, and we're so thankful for what he's done through us. Uh, and uh, I want to introduce to you my wife. Uh, her name's Rebel. Uh, with a name like Rebel, a lot of there's a lot of questions. Of course, is she from the South? No, she was from New York. Grew up in New York, or born in New York, grew up in Ohio, uh, and I'm a Georgia boy. So when her name was Rebel, I was like, "What's your name again?" You know, going into those things. Um, and uh, um, uh, our th- four children are here with us this morning uh, in Children's Church. We have our oldest, Atlas, uh, our oldest daughter, Journey, um, our um, uh, second oldest son, uh, Orion, and then Ocean, our youngest daughter. If you can't tell, we like different names and uh, uh, geography names specifically. Uh, w- with a name like Will Hill, Rebel Hill, you gotta you gotta keep on going with the strange names, I guess, right? Uh, without further ado, I want to show you a little bit what the Lord's been doing with a quick uh, video presentation, and then I'll come up, say a few things, and then preach. All right. There lies a beautiful city along the sparkling sea of Japan called Niigata. On Sundays, it is a bright and bustling city, but on most days, it's cloudy. And while the lack of sunlight has led to an above average rate of depression among her citizens, there is a far worse spiritual darkness that overshadows many people here. And yet, Rebel and I love this city. We arrived in Niigata shortly after a tragedy rocked one of its districts to the core. Although hope seemed grim, we came prepared with a burden already speaking the language and with a book of hope. The culture here is often skeptical of religion outside Buddhism and Shinto, which are Japan's largest religions. In spite of this, we immediately got to work. At first, finding a place to hold meetings with the desire to start a church seemed hopeless. But the God of hope worked, and he provided a place to rent, and we were able to start Kibol, which means Hope Baptist Church. With hope in our hearts, we went door to door, visiting and passing out tracts and inviting people to church. We planned and held events in our community. We reached out with the gospel to thousands in our city, and we hoped that people would believe and join the church. And that is precisely what the God of hope did. 
Sato is a carpenter by trade. He owns and runs his own business. He is a hard worker and very successful, and yet he knew something was missing. Day to day, he worked, got money, went home, ate, slept, got up, and the process started over again. He began to question the meaning of his life. He wondered if this was all there was. This could describe many people in Japan and even throughout the entire world. As Sato considered these things, a memory of some things he read about Christianity came to mind. He wondered if Christianity offered any answers. As he walked down the street, he wondered if there was any hope in Jesus. And in that same moment, he looked up and saw our church sign, Hope Baptist Church. By God's grace and planning, he put Sato right in front of our building on a Sunday morning, right as church was starting, with these thoughts in his head. He entered Hope Baptist Church, and for the first time in his life, he heard a real message on actual hope through Jesus. He didn't believe that day, but he came back to every service. He asked questions. He attended our Bible studies for weeks, and one day, he finally believed. He turned away from the beliefs he knew, and he chose Jesus. He accepted Christ in late winter and wanted to be baptized, but winters in Niigata are cold and snowy, and the Sea of Japan gets really rough. So instead of baptizing him in the ocean, I told him we would baptize him in a small pool in the church building. But Sato wanted the people of Niigata to know the decision he had made. He wanted to get baptized in front of everyone in the ocean. And so on the first day in which the ocean wasn't raging and the water wasn't freezing, we went to a public beach near the church. Sato and I walked into the cold, cold waters along with my son Atlas, who had recently believed and wanted to be baptized. And there, at Kobari Beach, in front of dozens of unbelieving Japanese people, Sato and my son Atlas were baptized. From there, the church continued to grow, and in spite of COVID, Kibo Baptist Church continued to meet. Visitors were coming, and souls were being saved. God was at work and we continued working. We started English classes and having more events to get as many contacts as possible. And over the past three and a half years, hundreds of people have come to our English classes and various events where they heard Hope's message. Many of these connections led to more international people visiting our church. They were living in Japan, but didn't really have a place to worship or a church to call their own. So in December, 2022, God allowed us to start an international service. This aligns with our hope for Japan to not leave just one church. We wanted to see multiple churches here. And though our second church plant in central Niigata stopped meeting because of COVID, our first church plant and the international service continue strongly to this day. And we've seen about a dozen different nationalities represented at our international church. As Hope Baptist Church continues to grow, the need for a permanent building is becoming more and more apparent. This is one of the reasons we are here stateside. We need to raise funds so that we can obtain a permanent place for hope to spread throughout Niigata, Japan. I ask that you would consider what you can do to help us raise the funds and purchase a building for hope. We praise the Lord for the hope He has given us and for Hope Baptist Church that continues on with national leadership and the help of our missionary friend, Mike Burgett, as we are currently stateside. God has saved and called leaders from the church, and we are excited about what God is doing here at Hope Baptist Church. Hope is all we have, and we are incredibly hopeful about the future. Um, if you could show the next picture, if you would. So this week we actually had an uh, incredible bargain come up uh, for uh, a building right around the corner from our church. Um, this is the building here. It was a bank um, not, not far from the church. I'll show you where it is in proximity in a minute. Um, but this building just came on the market. It is, it's about seven times the size of the building that we have right now. Um, and we were looking at another building. Um, and and it's, it's about seven times the size of that building as well. Um, and this, this property, this building uh, has parking for enough parking, which is a real issue that we have um, in our city. Uh, you have, we have to pay a, a monthly, we have to rent our parking basically. And then this building comes with 10 parking spots down in the parking garage, you can see it on the left. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, this, so this is the, like the first floor auditorium space that we could use. Um, this room, this room, just this room itself is about as big as our entire church building now. 
Um, and if we go to the second one as well. And then there's another space upstairs with uh, about the same amount of space as we have in our church building now. Um, and then there's rooms off of these as well as restrooms and things. Um, and our ability to be able to host people that come from America, we actually have a place for them to stay instead of putting them in a hotel. Um, and then one more photo, if you would. This is the floor plan here. Uh, there's, um, there's the basement over here on the bottom right. Your first floor um, is on the top right. I know there's Japanese. It's kind of hard to tell what's going on. Um, and then this one is the, the second floor. And then the third floor, there's a big, I don't have a picture of it, but there's a big flat uh, roof on this for activities for the kids. We'll put up a fence. Um, and a lot of schools and um, kindergartens have that. So th we don't have like a grassy area, but we'll make that into an area for the children to be able to have activities and things like that. And just to give you an idea where this is, we'll see that last slide. Our, our current church building is there with a cross that, that's Japanese, but it says Kivo Baptist Kyokai, which means Hope Baptist Church. And then you can see it's just to the red light, turn left, and it's right there, this other red circle right there. Um, and Lord, Lord has provided this property. It's $275,000 about with the current exchange rate, which is just an incredible deal. By far, it's the best deal that we found, uh, and we just found it this week. So if you would, please pray for us that we'll be able to get this uh, building. Uh, we have raised about $11,000. We're a long way from that, and so we're praying that Lord would really help us provide the funds. One of my main goals for when we go back is to get a building for Hope Baptist Church. We're spending about $2,000 a month just between uh, the, the rent, the space that we're in, uh, and, then our, uh, uh, and then the parking and all those. And a lot of that funds could go towards another staff member or more literature getting put out or more internet presence. A lot of things that could be done with that money rather than just putting it towards rent. So if you would please pray with us about that, that God would provide the funds uh, for that. Uh, but if you would turn your Bible. Time this morning. And so I'm going to go through this a little bit quicker than I normally would. Um, and uh, that way you guys can get home through this cold without having much issue. Um, but uh, the name of our church is Hope. Um, and it's been a, 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 a real theme of mine um, in Japan since we arrived in eight years ago in Japan. Uh, and that's because there's a lot of depression. There's a lot of uh, suicide in Japan. There's a lot of people that, are, that uh, don't have hope and they're, they're looking for things and they're uh, going for, the th those, uh, for those things. And they find that it's, it, it's not much hope in the things that they thought would bring them hope, like money and success and a good job. Um, but, uh, and there's a lot of fear, a lot of fear that goes along with that. And if you're, if you're like me, the last three years in like our church from 2020, uh, I guess now four years, uh, it, it's been uh, some rather difficult uh, years for a lot of people. A lot of people lost friends and loved ones to COVID, um, the economic downturn. There's been just a lot of things going on in our own life. We've seen a lot of difficult things, uh, friendships and, uh, have been broken, um, or friends I've seen fighting each other, just a lot of uh, division, a lot of people fighting, uh, let alone the COVID things. Our second church plant, uh, uh, we had to close it because my mom got cancer and we went back uh, to the States to be with her for a little bit uh, while she got a double mastectomy. Um, and then our friend helped with that. But then because of COVID, that whole area where that second church plant became like a ghost town and no one was showing up and we kept it going for about three months, uh, but ultimately had to make the decision to, to close our second church plant. Now our first church plant and our international church are both still going strong to this day. Um, they met this morning, um, which, which was actually our last night, you know, because of the time difference. And we're, we're thankful that those, those are two are still going, but from um, a 17-year-old boy, um, teenager, I, uh, I, it's been my dream to get the gospel to Japanese people, to share the gospel, to plant churches, and to see that second church plant have to close. It's, it was something I didn't want to do. I honestly got pretty depressed about it, felt sad about it, and uh, I, it was like watching a dream uh, die. And uh, I, it, it was a hard thing to go through, let alone my mom getting cancer and going through that, COVID, all, all the other things. Um, and I have found that uh, when life gets difficult, there is, there's just one, one thing that can really bring you hope. There's just one, one thing. And that's really what I want to share, from you, uh, share with you out of this passage today, uh, this one hope. 
uh, that, that is an anchor to our soul. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 19 this morning. Hebrews 6, 19 says this, which hope we have, what? <clears throat> As an anchor, right? It's not just an anchor, but it's an anchor to what? Our soul. It's an anchor of the soul. It doesn't get deeper than that. It doesn't get more profound than that. An anchor that is a hope. I'm sorry, a hope that is an anchor to our soul. And not only is it an anchor, because sometimes an anchor can break away, it can get stuck, it can, you know, uh, lo- lose your anchor. But no, not this anchor. This anchor is both sure and it's steadfast. Uh, it doesn't move, it doesn't change, it's not going anywhere. Um, this is this hope that I want to talk to you about this morning. Let's pray before we get in the, in the Word. Father, we love you. Thank you for all you've done for us. I pray, Holy Spirit, you use me this morning to be an encouragement to your people here. Bring hope. Uh, help us uh, to uh, get fired up for you um, in, in sharing the gospel with the world and to remember our hope is in you. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. So life, life is often full of wonderful experiences, but, it, you know, it's full of uh, soul-crushing experiences as well, you know. It's like life is it's kind of like a boat in the sea. On one day, the sun's at your, uh, the sun's shining, the wind's at your back, birds are chirping, it's a wonderful thing. And then <laughs> and the next day, everything in life is trying to sink your boat, right? The, the waves are, are crashing, the, the wind is blowing, you're getting tossed to and fro. Uh, it can get really rough. And, and, and in those times, some people uh, really get um, discouraged. They get, uh, they get bitter, <clears throat> they get angry. Um, sometimes because of all these things, they, they give up entirely. The storm sinks their boat. Um, and uh, they either live a shell of life or they take their own life. Uh, hopelessness is a terrible situation to live in. Um, and so from my experiences, I have found this one hope that is an anchor to our soul uh, that can bring us through the worst of situations. Um, but what is this hope? Verse 19 says, which hope we have as an anchor to the soul, right? So that which hope, the which there, is pointing back to something in earlier in the passage. So we need to find out what this hope is that is an anchor to our soul so that when we go through things, we know what it is, right? So look at verse 13. It says, verse 13, for when Abraham, I'm sorry, for when God made promise to who? To Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by what? Himself. God swear by himself. What is, what is that talking about? So when humans, when we make promises, because a lot of times we're not completely trustworthy, because when we make a promise, in general, humanity doesn't always keep its word, and so people will tack things on to their promises. There's a reason why we have lawyers and contracts, because a lot of humans break their promises. And, and even when kids, if you listen to kids, they'll, they'll promise, I swear, I promise, I promise to you. You know, they promise all kinds of things. I love hearing my kids make promises sometimes, you know. They got, I brother swear, I, I'm, I, I sister swear. I'm like, what are you guys talking about? It's like, well, we really mean it. Well, why don't you just say what you really mean, you know. <laughs> um, and so I try to teach them about, you know, let your yay be yay and your nay be nay. Um, and, uh, and so humans, like, we do a lot of things like when we really, sh- I swear to God, I swear, I swear on my mother's grave. You know, all these things that humans say. Why do we say those things? Because we don't always keep our promises and we need to build a stronger, a stronger promise so people will be like, oh, he's kind of really telling the truth. Or actually, probably when you say those things, it's probably more the opposite, isn't it? Um, but God doesn't do that, according to this passage, right? When he makes promise, what does he do? He just makes a promise on himself. Why? Why can God make a promise? And when he makes a promise, it's good. Because he's faithful. Because every one of his promises, he's kept. And when he made a promise to Abraham, what is that promise? Look further on, verse 14, saying, surely what? Blessing, I will bless thee. And multiplying, I will what? Multiply thee, right? And so what is this promise? At first, it's like, well, if you know the story in the Old Testament, Abraham and his wife Sarah were up in the years. They couldn't have children. They wanted to have kids. They couldn't. It was a big deal uh, for them to be able to have someone to pass their things along to, to continue um, the, the, the descendants and all those things. And so at first glance, this promise is like, oh, God is doing something special for this older couple. He's giving them a child. That's really nice. We serve a good God. No, it's not just that. Yes, it is that. And God is good to Abraham and Sarah. But it goes way beyond just them blessing with a, with a child, right? Because he says not only 
not only is he going to bless them with a child, but he says, Abraham, in you, in the story in the Old Testament, in Genesis, it says, Abraham, not only am I going to bless you, but in thee, in your seed, in your descendants, in thee, all the world will be what? Blessed. Now, what is that talking about? What does he mean by in the all the world is going to be blessed? Does that mean we're going to have financial success? It means we're going to get, you know, have a lot of uh, abundance of wealth and food and, and all these things and land? No, 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 no. To really understand what he's talking about in the all the world is going to be blessed, you got to go back to the beginning, literally the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? And then what did he do? He created the suns, the moons, stars. He put humanity, uh, humans on the planet earth. And then he placed them into a garden called Eden, right? And in this garden of Eden, there was no pain, no suffering, no death, no disease, no bad things, not, not anything, not death, anything. Everything that we needed was there. Food, everything, everything that we needed, there. And not only did it, it is this beautiful place, and not only did we have everything that we needed, but also God himself, the creator of the universe, had fellowship with us. How do we know this? Well, in Genesis chapter 3, it says that the voice of God walking in the Garden of Eden. Voice of God walking. Walking is a physical thing. That means God himself is walking through the Garden of Eden. And it wasn't written as like this, oh, what, this really crazy thing. It's written as if God, oh, it was like a matter, like his normal thing that he did. Which tells us that God had a fellowship, a relationship with Adam and Eve. He literally walked and talked with Adam and Eve, a close friendship, a relationship, a fellowship. We have everything that we need. We have a friendship with the very creator of the universe. Um, and what happens? Genesis chapter 3 comes along, and Satan comes, right, in the form of a serpent. And he says to Eve, um, Yea, hath God said. The first lie, the first thing Satan gets you to do is, did God really say what he said? Did he really mean what he meant? His first, Satan's always first attack is at his word, doubt, getting you to doubt his word. And so um, he says, did, did, did God really say if you eat, if, if you're going to eat this fruit, you're going to die, right? He gets Eve to doubt this. And that was the only command, if you remember the story. The only command, the only rule that God had for humanity was, all the garden, of all the trees, there's just one tree. Don't eat that fruit of that tree. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It wasn't an apple, by the way, in case you're wondering. Uh, it, was, it was something we have no idea of, all right? But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, okay? Um, God said, Adam, Eve, the moment that you take that, the fruit of that tree and you eat it, you will surely die. You're going to die. God made it very clear, one rule, one consequence, eat it, death comes into the world. Satan comes along and says, mm, no. If you eat it, what will really happen is you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Which is to say, you get to choose for yourself what's right and wrong. And he goes, I like that. And so does the rest of humanity. As you continue to read the rest of the Bible, you see like humans, it's a constant theme of ours. They did that which was right in their own eyes. They just have opinions about things and go, I think this is right, and I think this is wrong. Well, and then there's this other person that goes, no, I think what you say is wrong is right, and what you say is right is wrong, and then we have war because you're in my land, and, and you think that's your land, and I think you're wrong, where you think you're right, so we're going to fight. That's war. Humanity does what's right in his own eyes. And it started with this decision where we go, God, we don't really want you to make the decision of what's right and wrong for us. We want to make the decision for ourselves. We want to be like you. We want to hold your position of choosing what is right and wrong for our own selves. And so Eve takes the fruit, and then she gives it to her husband, and they both eat it. Do you realize what they've done in this moment? Their very close friend, God, who has given them life, the creator of the universe, has given them life, has given them everything that they need, and they have completely and utterly rebelled and turned their backs on God just for the sake of them becoming like God. Sound familiar? <laughs> they, t they turn their back on the Creator. Now put, your sh put, put yourself in God's shoes for a moment. I know that's a dangerous thing to do, but just for this moment, think about that for a sec. 
if you're God and you just gave life to this, these creatures, these, this creation, this humanity that you just made, you've given them everything that they needed, they didn't have to work for their, they really had to work. They, they had work, but it was like, it wasn't difficult. All, everything they needed was there for them. And you provided everything. There's no sickness. And there's no disease. They're free of all this worry and this pain. And then you say, look, there's this one tree. Just don't do that one. And in the moment they think that they're going to get something out of it and that you're holding out on you, they turn their back on you completely and just throw you away just for the sake of getting more. Now, if that's me, I'm probably going to go, forget y'all. I'm the creator. I don't need you. I never needed you. Goodbye. I told you you'd die. And now you are. See you later. I'm going to go start a new earth and a new human race. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. Instead, in Genesis 3.15, he makes a promise. He says, Eve, one day, there's going to be a seed of yours, a descendant, and he's going to crush the serpent's head. And, and when you read that, you're like, oh, I don't know what's going on. And then, and then the serpent is going to bite that seed, that descendant's heel. And it's going to be this mutual damaging of one another. But the, ser- the, the, the seed, the descendant, is going to ultimately undo Satan's kingdom. He's going to crush his head. That's a, a symbol of, like back in that day when you, you say that, to crush a head. It's to undo a kingdom. It's to uh, completely obliter- obliterate something. In other words, it's going to completely undo what has been done here. It's a promise. And it's going to happen through your descendant, Eve. And also, but through this, the, your seed will be wounded, right? So this is the promise. And at first, it doesn't make sense. But then you get to Abraham. And, and, and the reason why it starts to make sense is because he, he said, because through our sin, through this rejection of God's command, sin came into the world. And by sin, what came? Death, right? And then by death, the whole of creation was affected. How so? We read about it. God says that from now on, Adam and Eve, work will be done by the sweat of your brow. It'll be difficult. It'll be hard. There's going to be thorns. There's going to be briars. That means all of creation has been affected by our sin. Stuff got messed up. That means we've all been cursed. We live under a curse. So through Adam and Eve, through sin came what? All of us were cursed. But then comes along Abraham And then there's this promise that says, Abraham, in you all the world will be blessed. You see that? It's a reversal of what has taken place in Genesis chapter 3. It's a continuation of the promise of Genesis 3.15. And then Abraham has a son. God keeps his promise. But it goes beyond that. Because Abraham has a son. His His name is Isaac. And then Isaac has a son named Jacob. Jacob has a son named Judah. And then another promise comes along to Judah. And that promise is, the scepter won't depart from Judah till Shiloh come. And what that's talking about, Shiloh, does anyone know what the word Shiloh means? Peace, tranquility, right? Our daughter's ocean middle name is Shiloh. It's named after that passage of scripture. Also, it blends well with ocean, peaceful ocean, tranquil ocean, right? Um, so, in other words, Judah is going to, out of Judah are going to come kings. And that line of kings won't end till Shiloh come. And the way that it's written, it's not just talking about peace, but it's going to talk about, it's talking about one who's going to bring peace. It's a promise about the Messiah. It's a promise that goes back to Genesis 3.15 and the promise to Abraham that we're looking at here in Hebrews 6, 19. And 13, sorry, 15, 13, 14, 15. And so, uh, look, look at verse 15, actually, real quick. So, verse 15, 6, 15. Uh, and so, after he patiently endured, he what? Obtained the promise. God keeps his promises. He, he received the promise. He had sons, and then Judah came, and then there's this promise made to him. And then Judah has sons, right? And then comes along um, Obed, and then Obed has Jesse, and then Jesse has who? David, King David, and a promise is made to David. David, out of your line is this king that's coming. The king of kings and the Lord of lords. It's going to undo all this mess. And that's pretty much what the Old Testament is about. Man's failure and God's promise. Man's failure and God's promise. All through the Old Testament. And we open Matthew 
with uh, a generation, with generations, a list of genealogies. And you know, <laughs> the genealogy, so-and-so got so-and-so, so-and-so got, we got so-and-so, so-and-so got so-and-so. We kind of start skipping because it gets so long, right? Um, but it's incredibly important because we find Abraham as a son, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, right? And then sons, sons and daughters, sons and daughters, David, David, Solomon, sons and daughters, sons and daughters, sons and daughters, sons and daughters, Joseph, Mary. And that's where the New Testament starts. And then you realize this is the continuation of that promise. This is the one, the promised one, that all this mess is going to get undone. And you think, finally, the promised Israelite, the promised seed of Eve, the promised seed of Judah, the promised seed of Abraham and David, it's coming. But then, and all of it, all the promises before, except for in Isaiah, all the promises have seemed to be based on a human mighty king like David or Solomon, one that comes in with military power and might, a strong human king. But then when this child is born, it's not given the name David or, or um, you know, something along those, those lines. The baby's given the name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, which is God with us. And then you start to get something that this promise that's made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Judah and David and, and all the promises that have been made. It's not just about this strong Israelite king that's coming, but it's literally the very God that we rejected becoming flesh through the descendants of the very one that betrayed him. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14, same chapter, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The very God that humanity rejected became human, which means, why does God become human? Why does he take on flesh? To make himself vulnerable. You say, Whoa, 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 our God's not vulnerable. You're right, he's omnipotent, he's all-powerful, he can't be hurt, and it's exactly why he took on flesh, so that he could suffer, so that he could die. Why? Because that is the penalty of sin, death. And he who is life cannot die unless he takes on flesh. The whole story is this. God made us and he gave us life, and we spat on it. And we cursed God and we turned away from him. In turn, death came into the world. And we've lived with death. And yet he made promises to rescue us. And he did. God himself took on flesh. And he suffered sin's curse on the cross. And he died for you and me in our place. You know what that's called? Love. But God commended or showed his love towards us. And that while we were yet good people, wonderful people, perfect people, people that kept the law. No! While we were yet sinners, while we were in the very act of betraying him, while we were in the very act of turning against God, he showed his love in that he died for us on the cross. So what is this thing that gives us hope? What is this promise in Hebrews 6.19? This hope that says it's an anchor to our soul. When you really get a hold of what God has done to rescue you. He made this promise thousands of years ago. Genesis 3.15. It's a promise thousands of years in the making. And he's faithful and he's just to keep his promises. And he did. For God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but what? Have everlasting life. What does everlasting mean? It goes on and 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 on. It doesn't stop. If we could go back to the beginning of time, we won't even try to understand God before the beginning of time, right? We'll start with the beginning of time in Genesis 1-1 where God says, in the beginning, God. So we'll start there, okay? So from that point, and then, you know, all these promises that were made, and then Jesus came, and he, he died on the cross, and he, he rescued us from our sins, and then you were born, you're, this is the timeline, right? Okay, this is you. Right here. Everlasting. If we keep going, 
Where does it stop? Does it stop? So this is your life right now. So this hope that we have that is an anchor to our soul, it's both sure and steadfast. Get this. If we really have everlasting life through Jesus Christ, who is the creator God, who died for our sins, if we really have everlasting life in him, what does that mean about all the suffering and pain of this life that we're in right now? It, it, it's only ever this big. When you compare eternity and the promises that you have in Jesus Christ to your suffering now, it, can, it reveals itself to only be temporary. Don't get me wrong. In no way am I trying to lessen the pain that you've gone to. There's a whole book of the Bible called Lamentation. There's a real time to lament. There's a real time to mourn, to feel the loss. But I do want to leave you with the hope that you don't have to stay in the loss and the suffering because you have a promise that is a promise that's greater than your pain and suffering now. You have the promise of everlasting life through Jesus Christ who suffered and died in your place. That is love. And that is Jesus. And when you really get a hold of this hope, when you really get a, lo a hold of the love of God that he has for you, it becomes an unmovable, steadfast anchor to your soul. So that regardless of what happens in this life, you can go, I know who my Savior is, and I know what he did to fulfill his promises. And I trust that if he can save me from my sins and give to me eternal life, that which was lost in me, then whatever I'm going through now, he can take care of as well. Because my suffering is only just a moment. That's the hope that we have in Jesus. The only hope that we have is in Jesus. It's only in Jesus. I have an uncle I just visited up in New York. Uh, he had a stroke not too long ago. He can't move. He's an outdoors guy and he can't move. He's stuck in his house in New York winter and he wants to get out and he can't do anything. He can barely remember, he can barely talk. He can, bar he can barely do anything. And I talked to him, I was like, I'm up in New York, I'd love to see you. He says, I'm sorry, I just can't do it. I, I can't get out, I can't do anything. I, I want to, but I can't. He says, Will, to be honest with you, I wish I'd have just died. I wish I'd have just died. You tell me. What can you say to him that gives him any hope? Listen, we've evolved from uh, single cell organisms over the course of millions of years. Humanity is constantly developing uh, new medical procedures. We're getting better and better. We're evolving. At some point, we're going to beat this thing. You really think that's going to help him? What do you say to him? I said Hebrews 6.19. Uncle, there is a hope that we have that is an anchor to our soul. Jesus Christ, who loves you so much, died on the cross for your sins. He loves you. He knows what you're going through. And right now, he'll give you peace. And he's the only one that can. I'm so sorry for the things you're going through. He says, you know what? I've been thinking about that too. My only hope is Jesus. Because he is an anchor to our soul. It's Christ, and it's Christ alone. So, in conclusion tonight, uh, this morning, I haven't been preaching that long, I don't think. No. Uh, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 6, 19, we have this anchor. So, three practical things to do with this anchor that we have for the soul. What's the takeaway? There's three. Number one, you here listening. What's the anchor to your soul? We all have something. When stuff goes wrong, there's something we turn to. Sometimes it's calling a mom or a dad. Sometimes it's talking to our spouse. Sometimes it's pouring our life into work. Sometimes it's, you know, spending time with people that we love or 
some of us it's eating. <laughs> Good old biscuit and gravy. Amen? That's me, if you can't tell. Uh, eat my pain, right? Uh, the, uh, what are you going to turn to? There's only one anchor to your soul. This gravy sure is good, but it ain't going to help you. Pouring yourself into work might give you temporary success. The people that we love, that we talk to, sure it helps. But they're not always going to be around, and they're not always going to be able to help you. There is one anchor to the soul. It's Jesus. And if you're clinging to anything else, if there is any other hope, if it's, if it's even this church, if it's pastor, it will all fail you. It's only Christ and Christ, not to speak bad of Brother Henry. That's a bad decision for a missionary, right? No, Brother Henry is wonderful. Let me say that so I don't, you know, mess that up. No, I'm just joking around. Uh, but in all sincerity, Christ is that anchor that will not fail you. So this morning, if Christ is not the anchor to your soul, if you have not accepted him as your personal savior, if you're clinging to church membership or baptism or the good works that you've done, you're missing it. The only hope you have is in Jesus, and that comes by faith, by God's grace, and it is not about works. It's not about the outward things that you do. It's about your faith in Jesus. And if you haven't accepted him, accept him today. Number two, if you're going through something, you say, I am a believer. I have accepted Christ as my Savior, and I I'm going through something right now. Okay, I understand that, I and I've been there, um, and stuff can get really dark, and it feels like things are falling apart. Let me remind you of the story of Peter walking on the water. The only crazy human that walked out on water, right? Jesus says, come, and he comes. Uh, well, actually, Peter's like, Jesus, if that's you, tell me to come out of the water. Which, who does that, <laughs> right? Who goes, hey, tell me to come out of the water. Peter, I love him. I love him. Such, such, so much character there, so much faith. He steps out, and he doesn't immediately face plant into the water, right? He steps on the water. But then what happens? The winds and the waves get his attention. It's a strike of lightning. It's a really big wave that picks him up, a gush of wind that knocks him over. But he takes his eyes off of Jesus, right? And then he starts to sink. And all of the madness around him starts to encompass him, and it's all his world is. His world is chaos. But you know who didn't move? If anything, this one moved closer to Peter in the middle of his problems. And it's Jesus. The moment Peter cries out, Jesus is there to pick him up. I said earlier that life is often like a boat out on the seas and the waves. And it feels like sometimes everything is trying to sink your boat. But if you're a Christian, you're a born-again believer, you have an anchor. And it's not moving. It's not moving. He promised. It's a sure, steadfast anchor. But the winds and the waves can get so bad and your, your boat can move so much that you're like, I'm going to die. And you're so focused on the winds and the waves, you forgot the anchor. So this morning, remember the anchor. There's nothing that you can go through that's going to sever the line to the anchor. Nothing. Nothing that's going to stop that anchor from being sure or steadfast. It's an anchor to your soul. So this morning, you're going through something, remember the anchor that you have in Jesus. Turn to him. Ask him for help. Cry out to him. He will not leave you nor forsake you. He never has and he never will. Lastly, last thing and we're done. How many of you would say, by raising your hand as a, as a word of testimony, would say, I have gone through some stuff and if it wasn't for God, I don't know how I would have made it through. God brought me through something. Would you raise your hand and say, God brought me through it, and it was God alone? That's about everybody in this room. My dad taught me this. He said, son, a lot of Christians complain about stuff, and I can understand that. Life's difficult. But you know what? It's just as difficult for lost people. It's just as difficult for the person down the street who, who doesn't believe in God. He goes through the same cancer. They have the same low birth, birth rate, or they can't have kids, or they have a disease. They have poverty, but they don't have Jesus. Yeah, we go through mess, but we have Jesus. 
You just raised your hand. God brought me through. People have gone through the same things that you've gone through, and they don't have the God that's brought them through. They cling to all kinds of things. So if you could imagine for a moment a Japanese person out in the seas of life, swimming, treading water, screaming out, trying to cling to whatever hope he can find, to money, to success, to religion. But it doesn't have to be a Japanese man. It could be a Blairsville woman or man. There's people right here in this town. They're screaming out, somebody help me. Somebody save me. I can't make it. And they don't know Jesus. You do. You have the cure. You have the answer. You have the hope. Share your anchor. Share the story. Share the story. Everything that the people that are lost in this world have no hope, you possess it. You have it. Ro uh, Hebrews 6, 19 says, which hope, or hope we have. We have it. We possess it. Share it. Share your story. Share your story, church. Share your story. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. It's not going to get better unless you do something. Share the story. Share the story. I'm from Georgia. Georgia seems to get bit, getting worse and worse. Unless we speak, no one will. Unless we share the hope, no one will. There's a new generation. They don't know Jesus. And it's up to us to share. Share the hope. Share the anchor. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for all you've done for us. Work and move as only you can. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. Pastor, Emory, I'm just going to turn it right to you. Brother. Let's stand together with our heads bowed and eyes closed for a moment. Hope is what the world is looking for. Most of them are looking.